first thing we should establish really, I guess, is how and when did the Peshmo kind of get together? What was the instigating? Your department, that one. Nine years ago now, is it? Um, yeah, getting on, yeah, nine years this spring. Um, and we first formed, yeah, it was 1980. And um, there was actually, I think that's when Vince was in the band. There was Vince Clark, Martin, Fletch, and myself. Actually, they formed before that. They'd been going before that, before I joined. And they didn't have a sing really, so they, they, they came looking and found me. And then we sort of went on. Uh, Vince was only with the band for a short while, really. We were gigging for about a year, just doing general sort of clubs and stuff. And then uh, we made our first album, Speak and Spell, uh, which was very successful. And then Vince decided he'd had enough, really. And um, what else you know, you know, he just got fed up with the whole thing, sort of interviews and stuff, and touring and everything. He just really enjoyed being in the studio. Wanted to spend some time in the studio, and he he didn't have the time to do that because we were busy sort of doing a lot of promotion. So he decided to opt out, and that's when Alan came along. The main thing that really happened was that it allowed Martin to come forward as a songwriter. And um, before that, he'd been very lazy and allowed Vince to do all, all the writing. So really, once Martin started writing the songs, the whole kind of feel of the group changed quite a lot, you know, in the direction of the songs and everything. And it became almost a, a completely different band, really, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, first thing, obviously, people said was that the band's, you know, losing their major songwriter the band's got to be finished, you know. That was sort of what was said by the journalists and stuff. But um, we never actually thought that at all. We always, um, we never thought, oh, Vince has left now, we've got to stop. We were lucky enough to have two songwriters in the band. It was just that Martin hadn't really come out of his shell, as Alan said, you know. And um, he came forward and, and now has become a very strong songwriter. There was a time sort of in the last 10 years where electro techno music sort of became very popular and then the guitar bands really came in and there was a sort of a backlash mm. did you did you feel that strongly did you ever think well, you know, we've never really been aware of that sort of thing you know we do what we do and we use the instrumentation that we use um, we, we're not really swayed by what's in fashion if you like you know um, we just you know that's a, that's that's what we do you know we that's what we do. That's what we do. <laughs> I mean, you can't cater. You can't cater for trend. Otherwise, you know, you don't know. You end up going around in circles. We've really been finished yeah. a long while ago. If we tried to sort of jump on bandwagons and just like you know, play what, the kind of music that was fashionable at that time, you know, Depeche Mode have got a very unique sound, and it's something we're very proud of. You know. What, what's the appeal of the sort of the the, the technology and the the equipment? You know, is that is that sort of part of it? You know, playing with the, the toys timeless. sort of thing. It's well, no, the main thing about it is that it just allows you more possibilities and. Um, the, the choice for sound can enable you to sort of pinpoint more accurately the kind of atmosphere you're trying to create with the song. And so to us, you know, it, it just, it's a whole exploration thing, a lot of trial and error involved. And it can be quite fun, you know, looking for new sounds, sampling, you know, sampling can be good fun. And these are the sort of places that we're walking around in now where we might go to look for sounds, building sites, things like that. We often spend time before an album or the beginning of an album when we're first sort of getting our sounds together going around these sort of places looking for sounds, you know, and there's things all around the, around you that you can use. I mean, it's not, you don't have a particular idea. You might not say, well, look, let's go and smash this bottle against this wall. It's going to make a great sound for this song. You just build up a big library of sounds, and then it, when you're in the studio and you're looking for a certain type of sound to fit an atmosphere, you look through your library sort of thing and play the sounds, and then you find something, you think, great, that's going to work in this, in this part of the song, you know. <laughs> about videos, I mean, they're obviously a really important part of, of the band's image. You play live heaps of times, so everyone who goes can see the image yeah. that you have on stage, but the videos is a different sort of thing. Were, were you always into sort of the, the image that the videos get well, across? Well, no, not, I mean, it's something that we've taken more control over, basically, over the last sort of five years, I would say, that we've taken, taken a lot more control over it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to know what to do with a video, because you're constantly... Uh, having to make them, you know, for every record you release in order to compete and get yourself shown around the world. So um, sometimes it's not, it's not, it doesn't really come naturally to you to think of a visual idea to go with your music, you know. Mm. So what we really try and do is just try and work with people that we admire, people that we think are very good in their area. People like Corbyn, you know, who've been working with a lot. And Pat then let, let them think about it and we'll contribute to those ideas as well. And hopefully between us come up with something that's interesting 
interesting, a bit different, and, and has some kind of depth to it, and isn't just like some superficial kind of advert. It's kind of like when you come to the end of making a record, you know, you spend months in a studio perfecting this your piece of music, and then it's, it's a bit of a chore. You're drained of yeah. all your energy, and it's like a real chore, really, to then be told by the record company that now you've got to make a video for this. You know, it's like you feel that you've completed your work, and now you've got to move. You Suddenly, you know, uh, people, rock stars, pop stars, whatever you want to call them, have suddenly got to become actors as well, you know, in some the cases. And, and most rock stars, pop stars aren't good actors, you know. And so we try to do things in a different way and make things a, a bit more, well, we have done in the past in the videos, have been a lot more surreal. Um, and especially with Anton, you know, things, I mean, there was a bit of acting going on there, but it was supposed to be quite tongue in cheek, you know, and, and not serious acting, you know. There's too many of these videos that are far too blatant and far too. Uh, it's obviously people put in a situation they don't want to be in, and uh, sometimes it looks incredibly uncomfortable, and it's something that we just don't do anymore, we won't do. So, did you say to someone like Anton, hey, we've got some songs, we'd like you to help us with a video for this song, come up yeah. with something. Yeah. So the black and white sort of thing that, that was used a lot in, in his videos was yeah. his thing? Well, that's that's, that's Anton, yeah. yeah. I mean, he, he prefers to work in black and white, whether he's taking photographs or making films. And um, with, with us, uh, we, we liked that idea anyway. We, we felt there was a good uh, medium to work in anyway, so. No, they worked really well. I just wondered if the sort of somberness of it was all to do with him. Well, or it was you know, a lot of people said that, you know. That I don't think of, his... Uh, we wasn't aware of that. I don't think his films are somber anyway. No. Maybe the music is uh, at times. It all but, um, but I think there's a lot of humour in what Anton does. I mean, that's the good thing about working with Anton, for instance, is that it's not a huge crew. It's very much like what we're doing here. But Anton... And Anton's basically filming you, and there's a sound guy, and that's it, and, and the producer, and that's it. And so you can just get in the car and you go anywhere, and you look for scenes and places where you feel it'll work, and you just get out and film, and that's how filmmaking should be. Your motion picture debut. <laughs> how did this all come about? It's a, it's a live performance, isn't it? Well, the idea really is is that it actually contrasts a lot of what we've done on video with Anton, for example, in that it's a very realistic, straightforward, documentary-type film. Uh, although, I think, you know, Penny Baker's not keen on the word documentary, but, you know, most people will, will call it that, I think. But the idea really was that we just... We had this tour in front of us for nine, of nine months' length, you know, and we thought we had to document it somehow. And so the obvious thing to do is to do a live record and a film, so that's what we did. On the other hand, we didn't want to resort to all the clichés of that type of film. So we really had to find the right person to make it, which is where Pennybaker came in, you know. I think in the end, you get um, people will get more of an insight into what we're like as individual characters, you know, as opposed to this kind of overall image of a group that you normally get. So from that point of view, it might change people's ideas a bit about who we are as people. It's very real and it's very natural. It's, it's, it's what Alan said earlier about being the total opposite, really, of the film that we made, Strange, which we made with Anton Corbin. Um, you know, in 101, we're, we're seen as we are, as real people, and we're very honest about everything. And we try to, everything in the film, we're trying to be as honest about everything. The money that's involved, the production that's involved, we don't hide anything, you know, there's like, um, and that's how we wanted it to be. Too many, you know, too many of these films are all, they're staged and they're set and that's it. It's the band on stage, very nice, but that's it, you know. If anyone's uh, able to make that film, it's Penny Baker because he, He's he the pioneered the art of the rock documentary. And uh, also, the other idea that we had was to try and sort of relate what we're doing to the 80s and also the people that come and see us, how they, you know, re relate to the 80s and why it is they like our music and all that. So, again, he's kind of the perfect person to do that because he, had, uh, he could have a totally outside perspective, having been involved in a lot of the major people in the pop business in the 60s, you know, to then come and make a film in the 80s about it, he could very much, you know, see it in the right perspective, and he had no preconceptions about how to make a film like this now, and also about who we were now, you know, so a lot of advantages in using him, I think. I want to know if the difference in perception between the British public's view of you and the American public's view is to do with, like, a prophet not being welcome in his own home, or whether it's just 
something to do with a problem with the fans in Britain? Or well, no, I mean, there isn't a problem with the fans in Britain. We have a very hardcore following and always have had. Um, one of the main problems, I think, is the fact that we've had, we've sustained success in Britain for nearly 10 years now. And that's a long while to be successful uh, in one country. You know, that's where we began. And so there's a lot more focus on us always. And it's a smaller country and you, nothing gets hidden. In, in the early days, we made a lot of mistakes, um, not musically, but just in the things that we would do and the way we portrayed ourselves. It wasn't really us. We were pushing too hard and too keen to sort of get on and be successful and not really thinking about how we were coming across, you know, in, in doing these things, interviews, tons of interviews, TVs. We'd done anything that came along. And I think we've had a chance to realise that mistake. And in, in Europe and the rest of the world, America and everything, um, we've been able to put ourselves across the way we want to, you know, from day one because we've... And really, the press haven't really forgiven us, you know, in Britain for that, you know, so they're starting to now. I think um, we're becoming, um, the press is becoming a lot more friendly to us. Is it, in saying that, we haven't had that much bad, bad press, you know, it's just not been that favourable. <laughs> Why do you think the pop label has stuck to the fish mode in Britain as well as perhaps not anywhere else? Well, uh, you know, pop's always been a dirty word, that's the problem, you know. Um, we don't feel it is a dirty word, you know. Um, so you don't mind we don't mind that, a pop no, band. not as a pop band. I mean, in America, no, you get called a rock band more because you just grouped in as a. It's in some ways, it's more favourable for you to be grouped in than be called a rock band in America. You know, mm -hmm. uh, a lot more doors are open for you if you like. You know. I think Martin writes very much in a pop style, you know. He restricts his songs all, nearly always to three or four minutes length and they always consist of first chorus, middle eight and, you know, intro and end, you know. So, as I say, right, and, it, and a lot of the music he listens to is very much uh, 60s pop music along with other things he likes, you know. And he writes in a traditional way on an acoustic guitar, so there's always going to be that very melodic pop side to what we do. What, what do you think of the idea that, you know, the American club scene is saying that you guys were influential in the start of, you know, Chicago House yeah. and, and all this sort of stuff? Were you conscious or aware oh, that no, this was Oh, no, we weren't aware at all, but we, we find it very flattering. Um, it's not something we're, we have been aware of or are aware of at all, until we went to Detroit and met a few of these people and found that they were mainly influenced by European sounding music, you know, mm. other bands as well, like Kraftwerk, you know, mm. and they've been one of our major influences, so that's where the connection is, I think. And, you know, they like to take pieces of our songs and, and use them and, and create rhythm tracks and stuff. I don't know, it's not a direct. I think it's, our, as Dave said, it's our Europeanness that appeals, yeah. you know. They're looking for a different culture to draw influence from as opposed to their own black soul it's like white bands you know background if you uh, like white soul bands and white funk bands if you like they take their influence from black music you know and i suppose these guys are sort of turning the tables around and saying that this let's take our influence from something else you know and the whole approach to towards electronics is as as you said earlier back in fashion you know and that's another reason why there's an interest in us from them and so, also other groups like knights of red and yeah. craft work and that. Suddenly we're very hip, you know. It's all the European bands that you're you're saying as sort of influences or you align yourself with. Do you feel more European than say British? Yeah, definitely. I think we we yeah we are a European. I think one band, of the things yeah. that happens when you do a lot of travelling, like we've been lucky enough to do, is that you start to see your own country more in perspective and realise that there's For a lot it more is. to the world than yeah. just England and uh, your home background, if you like. So in that sense, I. Th I think we're more European, yeah. I think, you know, your question about yeah. the success thing, really, obviously, you know, we'd be lying if we said we weren't pleased that we're selling records and appealing to a lot of people and that that success is growing and going in the right direction for us. But I think, ultimately, you know, what you're really looking for is some kind of personal satisfaction out of what you're doing. And hopefully... I think the, more so as you go on, to be honest. I think, you know, that what I would like is that... It's just to think that we're making music that has some kind of depth, some kind of intelligence, something to say to people, for those that want to find it. And hopefully yes. we'll be looked back upon in years in the future, you know, by people, as something of importance, and something that had, you know, some music that had some relevance.